Good afternoon. I'm Walter Isaacson of the Aspen Institute. Now that I've said that, I can take my name tag off. And welcome to Aspen Ideas Spotlight Health. Thank you for coming. This is our fourth year of bringing scientists, community leaders, activists, policy makers, and people who have thought deeply and creatively about where we're going with medicine and health in our society. This all started about 13, 14 years ago uh, when uh, I came to the Aspen Institute, like some friends here, I came from New Orleans, and uh, we had a jazz festival. And I said, well, why don't we just have an ideas festival? Be like uh, a jazz festival without the music. Uh, but we are ending this one with John Batiste, one of the great New Orleans jazz musicians. I'm not sure how we're going to make it a connection to health, but I think you'll feel healthier listening to him at the final <laughs> session. But it was really when we decided, we listened to the people who were coming to Ideas Festival, and they said, do an entire session on health. And um, it was an important thing to do because health is not just a single topic, but it crosses everything we do in our lives. Everything, you know, from policy to how we live, to medicine, to research, and to science. Uh, it, over the years, we've had um, the heads of health and human services have been here, quite a few. I know Kathleen Sebelius is here now. We have Tom Price coming. Uh, but also Surgeon Generals, great researchers, the heads of hospital systems. And it is a perfect time to be doing it. I assume that today, tomorrow, the next day, we'll all be dissecting uh, the uh, alter Senate alternative to the Affordable Care Act. And uh, we're really going to have to have a s serious conversation, unlike the ones that happen in our political discourse these days, of exactly what it is we're trying to do, what our goals are. Because if you start with the basic goals and premises, most people in this country tend to share the same basic goals and, the, and premises, which is to get better health care, make it more affordable, and make sure more people have access to it. And uh, it's a complicated uh, way to put that into effect, but I think we have to start with the simple values and that arises from all the things we're going to be talking about here this week. It isn't just about coverage. It isn't just about policy. It's about every decision we make when it comes to wellness and health care. Um, one of the reasons I particularly like this is, as a biographer, I have always tried to write about people whose creativity and intelligence and passion crosses many different disciplines. Whether it was Benjamin Franklin, who, as you know, was very interested in health and medicine, and in fact, uh, came up with what turned out to be the right answer on the common cold, which is uh, most people then, and some people still feel, that colds are caused by getting really cold. He realized it was because there was too much bacteria in the air and he took every afternoon what was called air baths, which is he would air out his house, and he would sit there making sure that there was fresh air in the house. He was also very wrong on a particular issue, which was smallpox. He believed that the vaccinations weren't tested, that they might be dangerous. I think we know people nowadays who are skeptical about vaccinations. But when smallpox happened and took his youngest son, he did a lot of studying and a lot of thinking and became one of the great leaders in the vaccination revolution that happened in the late 18th century. I'm now writing, we'll have a book out in October on Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci thought of himself as an anatomist, an engineer, more so than just being a painter. In fact, he did enormous numbers of dissections and did the first illustrated anatomy, layer after layer of the human body, and connecting it, which was to what was then the greatest scourge uh, of the time, which was the plague, which had reduced Florence's population by two thirds. And like uh, Benjamin Franklin, he realized that it was both a medical and scientific issue, 
but also a public health issue. And he designed new forms of cities that had water in order to carry out, uh, to carry away the waste. So that notion of both health and public health is something that all great geniuses and all great thinkers have done throughout the time. I'd like to salute uh, Peggy Clark right there. Stand up, Peggy. Give me a chance to have a... <clears throat> Some of you may know that I'm not actually leaving the Aspen Institute, although I'm refer being referred to as forgotten but not gone already. <laughs> but at the end of the year, I'm going to move aside from being CEO. I still hope to be here next year and to be invited back and be, uh, not have to do the daytime work, but to have the fun work. But the person who first, when I first came to the Institute very quietly and secretly almost 15 years ago, because I was at CNN and thinking of leaving, it was Peggy who brought me all around, and uh, thank you, Peggy. Also, Ruth Katz. Ruth uh, runs our health program. <laughs> Ruth has uh, been deeply dedicated not only to the Aspen Institute's health program, but to a career spent in health in America. And now, we always have had a partner ever since that day 14 years ago when we did Ideas Fest. <laughs> And fortuitously, I was on an airplane with one of your predecessors, probably. And then with David Bradley, just made a handshake and said, let's do this together. That's with Atlantic Media and my good friend and now our media partner, Margaret Lowe of Atlantic Media. Okay. Walter, thank you for that and for all you've done to make this such a singular experience for all of us year after year. And hello, everybody. You all look incredible, like you're really happy to be here. So welcome. <laughs> I am too. Um, I'm Margaret Lowe, as Walter said. I'm president of the Atlantic Events Division. And my Atlantic colleagues and I are so proud to be a Aspen's partner for Spotlight Health. My team uh, spends the year crisscrossing the country and the world, and no matter where we go, there is no place like Aspen. Uh, I don't know if there are any of you who are first timers here, but I've all, I suspect all of you have discovered that the effects of high altitude on human beings is considerable. <laughs> we are 8,000 feet above sea level, 11,000 feet at the top of the gondola, and the thinner air means there is simply less oxygen to breathe. The chef, Emeril Lagasse, likes to tell the story that his favorite Aspen memory is serving an upside-down cake that had exploded because of the high altitude. It is indeed a powerful force. Your body will adjust. I suggest lots of water, not too much wine. We are all incredibly cheap dates at high altitude. But after several summers coming to Aspen, I'm now convinced that the thin air actually enhances the experience, help us, helps us unclutter our minds, opens us to new ideas and new ways of looking at things. So over the next few days, you're going to meet leading thinkers and practitioners from around the world. Our speakers uh, this week have come from as far away as Asuncion, Paraguay, and Kigali, Rwanda. And the lineup is spectacular, including a can't-miss late-breaking session tonight on the new healthcare legislation. Uh, beyond that, we'll learn about the aging brain, the epidemic of loneliness, the opioid tsunami, and the science of temperament. Find out if you're an introvert, an extrovert, or an ambivert. I have no doubt that this exquisite backdrop and mountain air will inspire deep thought, rich conversation, and that you will have a wonderful experience here this week. And now it's my pleasure to introduce a visual snapshot of what's to come prepared by our friends at Spotlight Health. The human body, a miraculous machine that moves and evolves, stretches and grows. From the outside, it looks like it could be just flesh and bone, but on the inside, the sum total of our humanity resides in all its physical, mental, and emotional splendor. Keeping this machine running takes sustenance, enough food, clean water, and safe shelter. But for it to thrive, it needs meaningful companionship and spiritual nourishment too. The human body also inspires endless inquiry and discovery, 
and only accepts answers based on findings and facts. But science and technology can only take us so far. Preventing illness and ensuring longevity demands both knowledge and resources, because one without the other just won't do. In the end, good health requires a commitment to ourselves and to one another. We are bound together in the natural and man-made ecosystems we all share. That compels us to join forces and find new ways to make good health possible for all people, wherever or however they may live. Without that, no other progress or triumphs are possible. Spotlight Health considers what it takes to celebrate lives rich in opportunity and challenge, filled with possibilities for the future. Get ready for a journey of body, mind, and spirit. We will look at the brain. How does it respond to joy, trauma, or loneliness? How does it learn, and why does it age? Can new innovations help us unlock more of our human potential? We live in a time when improbable advances happen every day, and what once seemed impossible is now within reach. Where bold entrepreneurs and scientists are sparking innovations that can lift up everyone, everywhere. How can we ensure these breakthroughs benefit everyone? We all know that good health is not just about medicine, doctors, and insurance cards. It's also about education, environment, policy, security, equality, community, and so much more. All of these issues have an impact on our health. When health collides with other challenges, new obstacles arise. True wellness requires that all of the angles be considered. From birth to death, we depend on others to nurture and heal us. But what should that care look like? How should it be delivered and by whom? How we tend to others at their most vulnerable moments and how we treat those who provide this needed care speaks volumes about our humanity. Let's make sure our actions reflect our values. You may attend other conferences that cover some of this ground, but Spotlight Health is unique in asking you to truly engage and fully reflect on ideas that can make a difference. Who knows, you may even have a breakthrough of your own. So take the time to ask questions and listen closely. Give your whole body and mind over to this experience. Wander, explore, dive deep, and have fun. Spotlight Health, not your ordinary health conference. Thank you for that. Uh, Walter suggested that I, I let you know where that uh, late-breaking conversation about our health, our, the new health care legislation will be. It will be uh, at Aspen Meadows downstairs at 9 o'clock tonight. Uh, another shout-out for the Aspen uh, Spotlight Health team, and my pleasure to introduce Peggy Clark, co-director of Spotlight Health, Aspen's vice president of policy programs. I can't get your whole title. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hello, Spotlight Health. How are you doing? <laughs> Welcome to Spotlight Health 2017. This is a wonderful, beautiful full house. We're so delighted to welcome you here today. Every year, I think it's our best spotlight here, but yeah, you're ever. But this year, it really is an incredible, incredible one. So let me just take a moment to recognize some of the people in this room. We are overjoyed to say that we have more than 100 scholars from all over the world, thanks to the generosity of our donors. And could I ask all of our scholars to stand up? <laughs> scholars, yes, let's give them a big round of applause. Beautiful. We're so delighted to have you with us. And let me also take a moment to recognize the mighty Aspen New Voices Fellows. Could I ask you to stand? Woo! Yeah! Woo! These are uh, experts from all over the developing world who are here to share their insights with you. And let me recognize for the first time this year the Health Innovation Fellows. Are any of them in the room? Could they stand? There's a smaller group. There they are, great, wonderful. We're delighted to have you with us. 
For those of you who are returning and for those of you who are here for the first time, you will find the next few days to be unlike any other conference you've ever been to, not the least of which is that we're sitting under a tent in the rain together, which is a pretty <laughs> wonderful thing. We like to call this health out of the box, health as it relates to the sciences, art, policy, music, and more. And one of the magic ingredients of Aspen Ideas Spotlight Health, part of the secret sauce, is you. The unlikely new friend that you'll meet and engage in an amazing conversation with. This happens every time. So let's take a moment to just turn to the person on your right and left and say hello. <laughs> Great. Beautiful. Great. I can feel it already. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Good job, everybody. Good job. I can feel it already. Excellent. So hold on to that energy, everybody. Great. All right, we're done. Just keep talking. No. Uh, let me say, I want you to hold on to that energy because this is one of the most beautiful things that Walter's vision has brought to the Institute to have these kinds of ideas. I can see you don't want to talk, with just stopping, which is great. Um, but we come together at a very intense and fraught moment, a moment where we need this kind of conversation more than ever. And you may wonder, as I do, as all of us on the Spotlight Health team have as we put this program together, whether in this time of really polarizing and emotional debate, it's possible to find common ground and to really create conversations that move us forward together. How can we talk together? How can we solve together? How can we dream together when honest discourse is so hard to come by, where science is thrown by the wayside? But try we must. And nevertheless, the Spotlight Health team persisted. So you are here together, and health, as we know, is at the center of some of the most intense debates that are happening right now, today in particular. And on the other side of those policy arguments, there's a very, very fundamental conversation about values. And this is what the Aspen Institute stands for and always has in its 70-year history. Is healthcare a human right, or is it a commodity? Should we lean towards government, or should we lean towards market? What is our responsibility as a society for those who are least able to pay for adequate health care? Do we believe in health care for all? And if so, how do we achieve it? We will forcefully and intentionally step on third rail issues here in the next few days. Healthcare reform from a number of different perspectives, the role of artificial intelligence, the boundaries of genetics, women's reproductive rights, drug pricing, planetary health, access to clean water, pandemics, and more. And we'll balance that all with, as Walter suggested, music, art, conversations about beauty, and the challenges of caregiving and laughter. We're honored to have the great choreographer Alonzo King with us this time. Don't miss his beautiful ballet performance. And the musician Jean Baptiste, and the founder and members of Second City Improv for all of those secret comedians in us. You'll have the opportunity to experience all of this, so just jump in. Let us create here the world that we're all craving right now, and let us work together to tackle the greatest issues of our time. As you all know, it is not possible without an army of people who make this, um, make this a reality for all of us. But in particular, we have really wonderful sponsors at Spotlight Health. And without this, it, we would not be able to do the work we do. So I'd like to take a moment to recognize each of them. We have loved working with you on your exhibits and your content and what you're doing. And we hope that we will be able to do this for many years to come. At the presenting level, our thanks go out to America's pharmaceutical companies, Care.com, Merck for Mothers, Mount Sinai Health System, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the SCAN Foundation. Let's give a round of applause for the presenting level. And there, there's more wonderful partners. At the supporting level, our partners have been Brigham Health, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Children's National Health System, City of Hope, National Medical Center, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, the Commonwealth Fund, and the Rockefeller Foundation. Thank you all.
And we have wonderful contributing partners, AARP, American Hospital Association, American Osteopathic Association, Annenberg Foundation, Caring Across Generations, Dignity Health, INFOR, RTI International, and Well Tower. Let's give a great big round of applause. We really, really appreciate you being here with us. So we're grateful for all of you. Now it's my very great pleasure to open Spotlight Health with 10 brave ideas. This is a real time for bravery. And so we've selected 10 of our most interesting participants to share their most audacious, out of the box, powerful ideas with all of us. So let's put our hands together and welcome 10 brave ideas. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Smolinski. I am the Chief Medical Officer and the Director for Global Health at the Skoll Global Threats Fund. My brave idea is a quid pro quo. My brave idea puts the public in public health. My brave idea will end pandemics in our lifetime. My brave idea is a global disease surveillance system that monitors the absence or presence of illness, location, vaccine status, and basic anonymized data from informed volunteers aggregated and mapped as a global good. I say informed volunteers because the quid pro quo of the system provides a view into the disease risk of their community as well as providing access to evidence-based prevention and control measures. So just like we put on a seatbelt when we get in the car and we put on a helmet when we ride our bike, we need preventive behaviors for epidemics and pandemics. An epidemic or a pandemic is an epidemic that spreads across the globe. If we use the power of the people already spread across the globe to be the canaries in the coal mine and to report human illness, animal illness, environmental concerns, then we can get a giant step ahead in finding the next outbreak before it spreads into an epidemic and certainly before it spreads across the globe. Informed consent, informed people, informed world. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Manmeet Kaur, and I'm the founder and executive director of City HealthWorks. I believe that for our nation's health to get through this crisis, that we need to prioritize creating a caring economy. <clears throat> Millions of people struggle needlessly to take control of their health and their lives because of social stressors and poor health. And a major barrier is intimidation compounded by increasingly low, weaker social ties and social support. I know this personally. I grew up in a household with an abusive father and an immigrant mother who was terrified of leaving, let alone getting help. Years later, we know that, I, I know that if there was someone from our community who looked like her, who had been through similar experiences, it would have dissolved the sense of shame that she felt and more importantly, would have made her feel less alone. And she probably would have made the brave decision to leave home, um, 40, she wouldn't have taken 40 years to make that brave decision. Millions of people struggle with um, the challenge of taking control of their life. And for many people, they need someone they can trust, who's been there, who they can relate to, who can help them make sense of, get back on track, but also make sense of an increasingly complicated world around them. I launched City Health Works four years ago with catalytic support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and others to create this missing layer in a health healthcare system. One of our health coaches, Lenny, who, I hired, who we hired in Harlem and trained, migrated from Honduras 20 years ago not speaking a word of English. And she knows very intimately how scary it feels to be in a doctor's office for her son's medical condition when she couldn't speak a word of English and she was piecing together sounds. Today, Lenny has helped millions, I mean, hundreds of her neighbors 
um, empowered them with the knowledge, the skills, and the confidence to take control of their health and to prevent costly, avoidable crises. I ask you today to join me and colleagues from across the globe, from Liberia to Harlem, in, enabling, in creating a nation of peers who are helping enable a more caring and connected society. I deeply believe that this movement is critical not just to our nation's health, but more importantly than ever, to our civic health as a nation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sue Curry, and uh, I spent nine years as the Dean of the College of Public Health at the University of Iowa, and I just uh, recently moved into the role of provost there. Um, let's think about the intersection of health and politics and the public. How do we move past the dysfunction of our current healthcare policy development, and how do we get the public involved in a non-reactive way? Five premises. There is a huge gap between what we know and what we do to improve health in this country. This gap is most pronounced with regard to prevention of the major causes of premature death and disability. Healthcare policy, legislation, and investment is not closing that gap. The public aspires to better health and well being. And public engagement in the healthcare policy and legislative process is minimal, and when it occurs, it's largely reactive. What can we do to push this envelope? Legislative bodies hiding behind closed doors to develop policy is not an answer. Using the election process <laughs> as a way to generate actionable ideas is not an answer. Finding and leveraging naturally occurring sources of large-scale public involvement that cross standard political divides is worth considering. So where did this land me? It landed me in the realm of reality TV. 70% <laughs> of the population admits to watching reality TV. <laughs> That is more than the percentage of the population that votes. So let's have a reality TV show, write that bill, to craft health legislation, <laughs> emphasis on health and not just on insurance and sick care. Six weeks, six areas of focus, six teams are given a component of health policy to work each week they describe their core elements to expert and celebrity judges, and the public weighs in through the use of social media. Let's see what that bill looks like. Thank you. Hi, I'm Deborah DeSanzo. I am the general manager of IBM Watson Health. In the last two months of my mother's life, I got a call from her at 2.30 a.m. She said, can you come get me at my grandmother's house? There's three men here holding me hostage. Now, my mother's grandmother died when I was five. There were not three men at her house holding her hostage. And in fact, that home was no longer even in my family. My mother was confused and she was suffering from dementia. I drove to her house. She was in her nightgown at the front door. She had packed all of her valuables in about 20 plastic grocery bags. She didn't recognize me. She thought I was her sister. But I've known my mother my entire life, and I was able to speak to her calmly and compassionately. I explained to her that this was her home, and I would go in and talk to the three men who really weren't there. Now we all know that genes are a large component of Alzheimer's and dementia, so I think about this a lot. My brave idea is Coco. Coco is a small, friendly, empathetic, cognitive companion, Coco. 
Cocoa will come into a person's home before significant memory dysfunction begins. Cocoa will be cognitive. She will learn a person's habits and preferences. She will learn patterns and reactions. She will read facial expressions in tone and volume of voice. She will understand emotions and she will interact as a friend. When Coco sees a change in pattern or behavior, she will act. Perhaps she'll just be a compassionate voice saying, this is your home, come back inside. Or perhaps she will call a family member, or perhaps she'll escalate to emergency, emergency medical services or the fire department. Coco will be a familiar cognitive companion, which will allow persons to live safely in their homes longer. Hi, my name is Minda Dentler. I'm a director of multinational operations at AIG. And my brave idea is to eradicate polio. I was born in Bombay, India, and I contracted polio as an infant, which left me paralyzed from the hips down. Unable to care for me, my birth mother left me an orphanage. By age three, I was adopted by an American family, and I moved to the US, where I was able to get the medical care necessary to be able to walk with leg braces and crutches. Ultimately, I also became an athlete. And in 2013, I became the first female wheelchair athlete to complete the Ironman World Championship. This experience profoundly affected my life. Not only did it transform how I thought about myself, but it also gave me a platform. It gave me a voice. And I became an advocate to end polio. Since then, the fight against polio has become even more personal. In early 2015, I became a mother. And when she was two months old, my husband and I took our daughter to get her first polio vaccine. And when we left the doctor's office, I could feel my eyes welling up with tears, and I cried the entire way home. I texted my best friend, and we listed all the ways my daughter's life would be different from mine, simply because she had access to a vaccine. Since 1988, more than 2.5 billion children have been immunized against polio, and an estimated 16 million children who otherwise would have been paralyzed like me are walking. We have come this far because of one great strength, partnership. And only through continued partnership will we get the job done. Thanks to an international coalition of healthcare workers, volunteers, government leaders, funders, and survivors like me, all dedicated to ending polio. I am here today to convey my hope that children everywhere, including my daughter Maya, will live in a polio-free world. We are closer than ever to making this hope a reality. Let's end it once and for all. Good afternoon, my name is Alonzo King. I'm the artistic director of Alonzo King Lines Ballet. My brave idea is that we love one another. Let's stop looking at each other as strangers. Let's decide that no one is a stranger from this moment and keep the heart open. We keep the heart open for people that we're familiar with because we say that's our family and usually it's us for no more. And I say we have to break that so that we can step into the realm of omnipresence and look at everybody, no matter how they appear as family, regardless of their appearance, you don't even have to know them. It can be someone on the street that you send the vibration of love to without even speaking to them so that the heart is open and healthy. It will change the world. Thank you. My name is Janara Nuremberg. My brave new idea is to turn upside down our notion of mental illness, particularly for women. I'm a writer, journalist, 
neurodiversity activist and author of the forthcoming book, Divergent Mind. Within a neurodiversity framework, we view the array of human brain makeups as part of our natural diversity. We don't pathologize them as normal and abnormal. I am incubating this in my own family and in small community groups in the US and abroad. It took until now, at the age of 33, after graduating almost a decade ago from the Harvard School of Public Health, and then a decade of science and innovation reporting since then, for a few key facts to emerge. One, women are, whoops. <laughs> An Aspen wind. <laughs> okay. Women are severely neglected in the neurodiversity research, particularly regarding ADHD and Asperger's. Two, I have ADHD and Asperger's. Three, there are enormous gifts that are literally being withheld from the world by virtue of how we frame mental differences and how we normalize a neurotypical viewpoint, which is a form of ableism. In my groups, I have folks coming forward from major corporations, Ivy League universities, speaking openly about being bipolar, ADHD, dyslexic, autistic. So imagine how many more of us are out there. What are we doing when we stigmatize or incarcerate such people? What are we depriving our communities of? In my experience, providing the space for folks to open up about who they really are and what their struggles are enables a tremendous amount of healing, growth, and thriving, especially when supported by bosses, teachers, and police officers. My brave new idea is simply making it equally acceptable and normal to talk about our inner lives as it is to talk about the weather. Thank you. My name is Dixon. I'm a psychiatrist and founder of the Friendship Bench uh, program. I live and work in Zimbabwe. My brave idea is to contribute towards narrowing the treatment gap for depression globally, because depression is the largest single cause of disability globally. And according to the World Health Organization, as we speak to you right now, there are more than 400 million people who are living with depression. But the real challenge is we don't have enough psychiatrists or psychologists to actually help those people. And that applies to a country like America as well. It's not just in low and middle income countries. My great idea is to work with ordinary people in our communities, empower them with evidence-based talk therapy particularly grandmothers. Because our work over the years has shown that grandmothers are extremely effective in cognitive behavioral therapy. And we've published this work recently in the Journal of the American Medical Association. I want to reach out to thousands of grandmothers all over the world, empower them with cognitive behavioral therapy because they are reliable, they will always be there, they never leave for greener pastures, they only leave to go to heaven. <laughs> and, and they are comfortable to sit on a park bench and provide therapy. That is my idea, thank you. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Anita Goel. I'm the chairman and CEO of an organization called NanoBioSim. As a physicist and physician, I've spent the last 20 years of my life trying to develop a deeper fundamental physics understanding of life and living systems. And my brave new idea is that by harnessing this new kind of physics of life and living systems, we can transform the rules by which we deliver healthcare on a global level. And I think we can do for healthcare what Google did for the information industry and cell phones did for the telecom industry. And that is to decentralize, mobilize, and personalize the entire next generation of healthcare. Our entire healthcare system has reached a tipping point, a verge of massive transformation. For the past 400 years since the last industrial revolution, 
our delivery model for healthcare is based on a centralized model. Patients and their clinical samples have to be transported to a centralized lab or hospital to get reliable information about their health. The result, four billion people on the planet today don't have access to this basic infrastructure. And here in the United States, we have a multi-trillion dollar crisis on our hands. Infections like Ebola and Zika, much like information, can travel at lightning speeds. In the age of self-driving cars, smartphones, and nanotechnology, why are we using 40-year-old technology, big, fat, mainframe machines to fight diseases that have the potential to wipe out a fraction of the human race? It doesn't have to be that way. Imagine a world where with a mobile tricorder-like device, we can detect in real time with nanoscale precision diseases like Ebola and Zika and stop outbreaks before they become full-fledged global pandemics. Imagine a world where we can personalize medicines and nutritions and the entire lifestyles of people based on information in their DNA and RNA. You may think this is science fiction, but it is not. I'd like to introduce you to Gene Radar. This is our mobile tricorder-like device that was uh, awarded the first X Prize for healthcare and recently got FDA approved for a Zika test that can do real-time Zika sensing at a molecular level in a mobile device where sometimes pregnant women in Brazil are waiting several weeks to get an answer. And this is uh, the beginning of a pipeline of apps or innovations for global health. I believe another brave idea, that your DNA is like a piano. And the music that you as an organism play is not just the information in your DNA, but it's an interplay of the information in your environment and the information in your DNA. And as we advance science and tools to bring, uh, to really maximize that information and that handshake, we can optimize our genomics, our, mic our, our, uh, our transcriptomics, our microbiomics, to really bring a new generation of healthcare you can even envision a day where we 3D print food and drinks, for example, with your personalized probiotics. Food itself could become a medicine. You could envision anti-aging and wellness, where the parameters of our life are optimized to handshake the information in our DNA and RNA. This is our opportunity as a human civilization to raise the consciousness of our planet and bring the human race to a new quantum level of health, wellness, fitness and longevity. By empowering human beings with the tools to take ownership over their health in an entirely new way. And after all, if we can improve our health at the individual level, optimize it at, at the family level, at the community level, our nation, we can really build a more optimized health for our planet. Thank you. Hello. I'm Dr. Willie Parker. I'm a board certified obstetrician gynecologist, a new author of the book, Life's Work, A Moral Argument for Choice, and the board chair of Physicians for Reproductive Health. <laughs> My brave new idea what won't cost us a penny, but the, the benefits will be priceless. About a year and a half ago, when I met my shero, Gloria Steinem, she gave me, for the first time, she gave me a bracelet that said simply, Imagine if we were all linked and not ranked. I haven't been able to stop thinking about what that means. Imagine a world where all men can exercise the power that we all hold, no matter what our race, religion, or station in life is. The power to betray patriarchy. We can all become traitors to that birthright of male privilege afforded to us at the very moment that the birth attendant says, it's a boy. Divesting of what I feel to be the cornerstone of the most structural oppression in the world would cause many of the injustices to crumble. Racial and ethnic tension, class wars, sexual identity oppression, and Islamophobia. Imagine if men could see reproductive injustice as, a, as their battle to fight, not from a place of chivalry, but from a duty to humanity. We could then all realize that on this spaceship that we call planet Earth, there are no passengers. We're all crew. So my brave idea is that I will continue to divest of patriarchy personally, the patriarchy that I was born into, 
and I call upon all patriarchs, both male and female, to join me. Then and only then can we be linked and not ranked. Imagine that. Thank you. Let's give another shout out to those brave ideas and those even braver souls. Woo! My name is Katie Drasser. I'm the Managing Director of Aspen Global Innovators Group. Um, I have the privilege of being on the team that raises the barn of Spotlight Health. They are awesome. Um, but that means I have an inside look at how to make the most of your time here. So I'm going to share three little things to keep in mind before we go to wine that way. Number one, be curious. Uh, this morning we were in a room full of global health security experts who are on the front lines of pandemics and face pretty scary things. And Mark Smolinski, our first brave idea, reminded us that curiosity outshines fear every time. So be curious, flex your appreciative inquiry muscles and ask lots of questions. You'll also make more friends if you do that. Um, learn something new. Uh, we've designed Spotlight Health to talk about all kinds of things. Peggy mentioned art, Walter mentioned Baptiste, we saw Alonzo. Um, we have Anita Goel with that jean box that won a prize. There's so many things here <laughs> to learn about um, that you probably didn't know, even though we're all experts in health. Um, I learned recently that comedy and improv can make you a better caregiver, and I know there are a lot of nurses and doctors and parents and others in the room. We have a whole workshop on that and a session. Go learn about that. Those tools feel useful to me. Um, given recent events, some people may want to understand the link between guns and public health. Uh, our former U.S. Surgeon General, who may be in this room, is giving a session, a late-breaking session tomorrow at 5.30 to help us really understand that link and what we can do about it. Um, even the most celebrated experts in this room have something new to learn, so try it. Number three, let people surprise you. Uh, meet someone new. I think you got a sense of who's in this room from the 10 amazing people who came on this stage. There's like hundreds more of you. There are so many more of you. And there are tons of opportunities to meet people. Tomorrow morning, you can take a walk starting from Door Hosier, and it's for a good cause. You can walk with someone you've never met before. You also can learn about your brain on nature up at Maroon Bells. I'm supposed to tell you that it's capped at 50 people. There's a sign-up sheet at the reception. So sign up if you want to go see the sunrise at Maroon Bells. It's going to be awesome. There's a whole session up there about how you Nature is good for your brain. So sign up for that and meet someone new along the way. Um, lastly, we have a reception right after this. That is a terrific place to raise a glass with someone you've never met and toast what it is we're all here to do. So thank you for being here. Uh, from here on out, the spotlight is now on you. So go out and have fun and enjoy. Thanks for being here.